it should be a nonpartisan priority to take back control of our food sovereignty in this country. The centralized structure of the food supply chain in the United States has made it vulnerable to disruptions caused by natural disasters, pandemics, or other crises. How many of us know a local farmer or rancher? If ish hits the fan and grocery stores run out of food, do you know where to get food? And as a separate conversation, do you understand how corrupt the food industry is, specifically with our meat? What you are about to hear today from a member of a fifth generation cattle ranching family will change your life and how you think about food forever. Today's guest believes the food supply chain is not only an economic issue, but also a matter of national security and that our over-reliance on a few large corporations for the majority of the food supply puts the entire system at risk. It is essential that we support and strengthen local and regional food systems to increase resiliency and ensure food security for all Americans, and to also educate Americans about processed food and the truth about what we're buying at grocery stores. My guest is dedicated to empowering farmers and ranchers across the country and cutting out middlemen to enable direct sales to customers. He has created a way to put the power of food back in the hands of the people like you and I, and it's expected to go live in March 2024. God willing. You're going to hear today all about his solutions-oriented approach to one of the world's biggest challenges, feeding the masses with high-quality food at prices people can't afford. Now, you're going to hear some hot takes, especially if you're in the ag industry. But I'm not here to protect feelings. I'm here to protect the people. You can watch this beautifully shot interview on The Real Alex Clark YouTube right now with your own family or listen anywhere you get your podcasts and help us close out the year strong with a five-star review telling us how the spillover has impacted your life this year. The more reviews we have, the more credible this podcast looks to potential guests so we can keep blowing minds in 2024. Now, please welcome AJ Richards to The Spillover. Tell us about who you are, how you came to know so much about our food supply chain in America and just agriculture in general. Yeah. Uh, so my name is AJ Richards and uh, I'm, I grew up in Southern Utah, a place called St. George. And my family were our five generations of ranchers. So in 1916, the federal government made homesteading available in north side of the Arizona uh, of the Grand Canyon. We call it the Arizona Strip affectionately. Um, so 1916, they went out there and government said, look, this place is harsh. If you can make it work, plant your flag in the dirt and it's yours. And so my ancestors went out there and basically homesteaded that area. And since then we've been working in agricultural production, specifically in, uh, in cattle, um, cow, calf, that kind of operation. Talk about the food supply chain Mm -hmm. in America. Who is running it? Who's in control of it? Right now, the the meat supply chain, specifically beef, is controlled by four major corporations. You've got JBS, Tyson, National Beef, and Cargill. Those are the four largest corporations. Two of those, by the way, are foreign entities. So Tyson is China, and JBS is Brazil. So the chicken you're getting, like your Tyson chicken nuggets, is from China? It's a Chinese-owned uh, company, yeah. And not that the meat's from there, but it, it's owned by a Chinese corporation. And... Um, they do basically, and they're, you know, every company is set up with the focus to maximize profits. So they don't care about anything that's going on around that. It's just how do we make the most money? And so what happens is you start getting into like imports and exports and, you know, beef prices go up for producers, ranchers that are selling the, the cost of an animal goes up at the auction. And all of a sudden we see increase in imports because they can buy it cheaper from Brazil or Paraguay or Uruguay or South Africa, ship it over here and then distribute it throughout the country. So they buy it cheap, sell it to you for more. And then our ranchers are barely making anything at the auction. And so they'll manipulate the market that way. So yeah, those four companies, two of those are foreign entities, and those are the two largest in the world. What kinds of corners are being cut with the meat that we're getting at our grocery store? That's a good question. And one that uh, is, it's really hard to track down exactly what's happening. But when we look at sort of, the idea that maximizing profit is the only focus, we can start understanding that the decisions being made are not made for your health. I mean, look at the chronic health in our nation. It's going through the roof. And chronic health issues are solvable 
by lifestyle choices. In other words, what you eat, uh, what are you eating and are you exercising? So we've got this massive chronic health issue throughout our nation and our food is getting worse and worse in terms of highly processed food, right? If you can't look at a label and pronounce everything on that label or just know like if it's a potato, it says potato. If it's beef, it says beef, right? Right now, there's also a push to put the mRNA vaccine in our meat supply. So they've already approved provisional use in pork and chicken. Beef is next on the docket and it hasn't been approved yet. Why should that scare us? Well, I mean, look what's happening with everything we're hearing about the mRNA technology in the vaccine, right? Blood clotting and all of these other challenges that people are are dealing with now. I've, I've met people that, you know, their entire family got vaccinated, thought that was the right thing to do, and now they're all vaccine injured, you know? And so we don't know the full implication of what happens when you manipulate the vaccines for our livestock and how that will carry over. So my whole thing is, why are you even messing with it? Like nature has a way of handling things on its own if it's done in, in, a, in a natural way, um, like rotational grazing, regenerative agriculture, and those kinds of things. You don't need vaccines. You don't need antibiotics. You don't need all of these inputs to keep your animal healthy when it lives in a healthy ecosystem. Now, there is something to be said for the amount of population that we have to feed. You can't do everything out on pasture, out on grass. You do have to have feedlots. Yeah. And so that's what I'm trying to figure out. Mm -hmm. What is ethical? How do we do what's best for animals in the environment, but also what's going to be the healthiest for our food? Yeah. So, you know, really, there's kind of two sides of that. There is this, I believe two things can be drew at the same time. And that's just how it is. So on one hand, what's better for you and I, if we understand the implications of the food we eat, is to buy from a regenerative farm and ranch. The quality of the meat is higher. The life of that animal was really, really good. I mean, they had a a regeneratively raised animal, had an incredible natural life all the way up until freezer camp, until it was time to go to the, to the meat locker, right? And th- so they have one bad day. And on that bad day, they don't even know it's a bad day. I've been, in, I've been around that s- the industry I'm in. Sometimes I wish I could go the way they did. There's no suffering, you know? So for those of us that want to really fully understand that side of it, then you should seek regeneratively raised product, whether it's uh, through the Savory Institute has something called Land to Market or uh, another group has a program called Regenified that's coming out. So you can start looking at these brands and if they've got these symbols, these these uh, markers, and you know they've gone through certain protocols. On the other side of that, though, if you're going to go to Vegas and eat a buffet or even a steakhouse, any any steakhouse, the amount of steak that they go through in a night, you can't uh, source that from a regenerative source. So I eat meat, beef specifically at steakhouses the same way I eat sweets. I choose to eat it when I know it's a special event, but in my freezer at home is not commodity beef. Okay. Commodity beef being whatever came out of a feedlot, right? I don't buy from the grocery store. And explain mm-hmm. why is that different? Why is that beef different than a regenerative agriculture cow. Yeah. So a couple of things. One is the feed that they're given is not natural to an animal. So a feedlot, we talked about maximizing profits, right? An animal raised regeneratively is going to take somewhere around 30 months to get mature enough, big enough to process, to put in the freezer. In a feedlot, they're trying to shorten that time. And so they're down to about 18 months. Okay, so that animal's been alive for 18 months, but what they're doing is feeding it a uh, diet of corn and grain that speeds up its fattening process. If you were to take, uh, I don't know that anybody's done this research, but if you were to take a regenerative cow and a feedlot cow and kept them on their, their diets, you'd probably see that feedlot cow dying of medical complications within a couple of years. Whereas the cow on pasture living regeneratively would live for 20, 25 years because it's an, it's, it's healthy, right? We're no different as humans. What we eat, our bodies manifest and we are either healthy and happy or we're struggling and we can't figure out what's going on. It's all food related. Same for the, for the animals. So you've got that as one of the aspects. The other aspect is to keep an animal healthy, or maybe I should rephrase that, to keep an animal alive, because there's a difference, in a feedlot. You have to give it antibiotics because feedlots, they're filled with manure. So they're standing in manure all day long, every day, because that's just the process. So in order to keep them that animal from getting sick, they give it antibiotics. Now, they have this 
time period that they claim that the antibiotics has worked its way out of the system so it can go into, you know, our meat production. But we we don't really know. Nobody's trying to do that research because the implications of that could be detrimental to the ones that are in control, right? Mm -hmm. What what benefit would the people controlling all this have in really understanding what the certain vaccines they're getting are doing to the meat and us consequentially, right? Or the antibiotics. Uh, there's no reason to go do that research because I promise you it'll point to you're eating, you're feeding people very unhealthy uh, products. Now, with that said, there was a couple of researchers, Diana Rogers and Rob Wolf. They wrote a book called Sacred Cow. It's phenomenal. And they said, we wanted to prove that grass-fed and finished beef was healthier for you than commodity beef uh, raised in a feedlot. Ultimately, the research came out and said that the difference in nutritional value was not significant enough to vilify beef if all you can afford is going to Walmart and buying beef. You still should. The amount of nutrients in that meat is still so much better for you than highly processed foods. So the research ultimately said there's not a big enough difference. Now, following that book, new research has come out around regeneratively raised beef. So what that would look like is an animal that lives, like I was saying, out on pasture, but that producer who's raising that is focused on soil health as the foundation because healthy soil provides healthy feed, which provides healthy animals, that provides healthy meat for us. So they're focused not on yield, not on how much we can turn over quickly. They're playing the long game because they're looking for a healthier product at the end, which also over time provides a much healthier environment, which means more feed so they can carry more livestock. So when I said earlier, we can't feed our population on regenerative beef, that's only currently. If we had this massive shift, and it won't happen, but if we had a massive shift in how we were sourcing our food and how we raised livestock around the country, we could raise enough beef possibly for our population and not have to use feedlots. The reason we say that is because before we colonized the United States, there were bison roaming the West in the millions, tens of millions, something like 60 million bison roamed the West during that time. Uh, you can see historical pictures. Everybody's probably seen the pile of bison skulls that that guy's standing next to. What happened was when we removed bison from the land, we started what's called the desertification process. So this global warming BS is not that simple. It's not what they're painting it out to be. Global warming is not climate change is just, you know, what the left is doing to push control. But what we are seeing is desertification. Well, desertification is a symptom of the removal of ruminating animals. Beef, I mean, bison, goats, sheep, ruminating animals. There's a, you know, God knew what he was doing when he put this world together, right? And there's a ecosystem that works as a whole. And this is why regenerative agriculture is fascinating, because it's something that conservatives like, mm -hmm. but also the left loves it because it's climate friendly. Yes, absolutely. When they talk about methane problems and, and, and cows being the problem with the environment, it's not the cow, it's the how. Meaning when you're importing, like this year, we increased our imports by 11%, which was 900 and something million pounds of beef. And again, it was because prices for the producer at the, at the auction started going up. Well, those corporations need to maximize profits, so they've got a whole system in place where it's like, that's eh, too much in the U.S. right now, so we'll bring in more from out of the U.S. So when we were comparing the grass-fed beef versus commodified beef, and then we have regenerative meat, what did they find on how eating regenerative mm -hmm. meat impacted human health? So regenerative beef has a significant, like a significant 70% plus increase in phytonutrients and essential amino acids. And then the omega-3 to omega-6 ratio in regenerative raised beef, which omega-6 causes inflammation. What we learned during COVID was the people most susceptible to being severely ill or dying of COVID was due to inflammation. That was it. If you were, like I had COVID twice, I went, I worked, didn't have people around me, but I went to work because I had to work. I'm an entrepreneur. I got a, got a job to do. But because my metabolic health was so good because of my lifestyle, I could work. Now, I felt like shit, but I could still get the job done, right? 
if you're in the ag space, you're going to work. Like you got to be missing a limb to go to work. And half those guys would tie that limb off and keep going if they could, you know, <laughs> there's a joke that I saw this meme one time, two nurses were talking and said, farmer John's here. And they're like, farmer John's here. Like this is ER, nur- like ER nurses and like farmer John's here. I'm like, yeah. Is he with his wife or is he with by himself? And they're like by himself. And like, it was like cold blue, right? Cause those guys won't go if they've got work to do. So your metabolic health is significant. So omega three to six ratio is, is important. The reason we have fish oil supplements is because we're not eating wild game. If we right. ate wild game, your omega threes in that meat is high enough that you don't need to supplement. Why does it matter that only four companies control our meat in America? Well, COVID was a snapshot of that problem. And I would say that we are probably only 75% recovered as a supply chain, as a food supply chain from what COVID caused, you know, almost four years later now. So just like anything, if you centralize and there's a break in that supply chain, you have caused major downstream effects. So what we saw during COVID, if you remember, they were talking about all these uh, pigs being slaughtered and buried or milk being dumped in the fields or, you know, uh, uh, onions being just wasted and cows even being slaughtered. We call them culling. Culling is the term you use when you kill an animal that doesn't go to food. So you're taking it out of the herd, right? Uh, it's not always that, that way, but they culled so many animals because what happened is we have a system that the way it works is the big four buy from an auction house and they send those animals to a feedlot until they're ready to go through their processing plants, okay? When those processing plants closed because of illness, you had this downstream backup of everything that used to work smoothly because when it works well, it works well. But you change that and all of a sudden you've got a problem. So the feedlots that were fattening animals now have all these animals getting fat that's costing money and nowhere to slaughter because the slaughterhouse is closed. Now, before the feedlot, you have all these ranchers that have livestock to sell, but they can't sell because nobody's buying because the feedlots are full. And so now, like I was selling beef for my family's ranch and I called to get a slaughter date and they're like, we can get you in 18 months. I couldn't get a spot to process my animal for 18 months because we've even lost all of our small meat packers as well because the big four have manipulated this country and our food supply chain in a way that serves them and not anybody else. What do you mean by manipulate? Well, so if I control the, if I'm big four, I can control the market. Just like I was saying, prices are up, so I'm going to import more. So now prices go down. Prices are down. People are starting to go and do their own thing. So I'm going to start paying more so that you're not selling direct to Alex. You're going to keep your beef because I'm going to make it more profitable for you to come. So it's like, it's like this eight year swing. Things get bad, they make it better and they drop it again. And so producers are on this vicious cycle of just barely making it by if they make it by. We're down to 700,000 ranchers in our entire country. Is that scary or a good? That is terrible. What is it supposed to be? Well, we used to have 10,000 meat processors in our country. We now have 2,500. We used to have, I mean, you could go anywhere across the country and somebody was raising some kind of food that you can source it, right? Now it's illegal to buy raw milk, but you can go to California. You know, you can't buy raw milk in California, but you can buy heroin. Like what the hell? I think it's a, my opinion is it's a, it's a move to keep us weak and sedentary so that we don't stand up against corrupt forces that are coming our way. I think the UN, the World Health Organization and the W, the, the WEF, the World Economic Forum, they want control. We're the last thing in the world holding back freedom or keeping freedom. We are, we're the only country in the, it, And it's all around our Second Amendment. If we lose our Second Amendment, the dominoes will fall. It'll be over. PSA, that phrase, Merry Christmas, you filthy animal, is extremely offensive and not inclusive. To those of us with clean, glowing skin, thanks to Nimi Skincare, no filth here. Another day, another DM from one of you. 
This one is from Kayla, and it says, Alex, I have never had soft and hydrated skin during the winter. I'm born and raised in Wisconsin, and I accepted a long time ago that in the winter, my skin would always feel dry and chapped. I bought the Nimi Hydrating Cleanser and Hydrating Night Cream per your recommendation. I actually cried because for the first time in my life, I'm getting compliments on my glowing skin in winter. It's officially hot girl winter, y'all. Nimi is a Christian and conservative-owned modern skincare company company that is transforming faces, not just this Christmas, but all year round. Customize your simple three-step routine based on your skin type at NeemySkincare.com and get 10% off with code Alex Clark. Go to NeemySkincare.com with code Alex Clark for 10% off and give the gift of confidence from glowing skin for Christmas. What is the reality about how the animals are being treated at these big meat packers? You got a little caged bird you know if you're eating chicken most likely and you don't know where it came from that is that's a bird that grew up its entire life in confinement that they grow quickly but still you're talking about eight weeks just in a cage that they can't even turn around in and they pull it out throw it through a processor and then it goes that way but what's really freaky is that you see these images of these factory farms the chickens are pumped with so much chemical. Mm-hmm. They're they're massive. Mm-hmm. I saw this study, uh, I think it was the University of Arkansas did, about how if we gave a human two-year-old the amount of hormones that we're giving these chickens for like, you know, that are fast food restaurants yep. use and stuff, a two-year-old human would gain almost 700 pounds in two months. Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. We did pasture chickens on our in our homestead and we tried it out and we did what was called a Cornish crossbreed. They've been bred so many times to be as big as possible that if we didn't process them in eight weeks, they would break their legs under their own weight. They're breaking their their legs. They can't even walk or yeah. move. And then also it's like they're disfigured, like their mm-hmm. heads are growing on backwards and upside down. <laughs> yeah, How I've do you explain that? Well, those are just going to be conditions of probably, you know, genetics and, and vaccines and antibiotics and all these hormones that, again, like we said, nobody's doing the full research because I think it'll point back to some really negative implications. If you raise your own birds, you know, I can raise this bird that's going to yield this weight and I don't have to raise as many, or I can go a more natural way with a bird that can live out on pasture and then I can just go grab the one I want when it's time to eat. Like that's the method I prefer, a bird that's dual purpose. Talk about how a lot of farmers recently, because of inflation, are feeding their animals junk and garbage. Yeah. Yeah. So there's been some videos floating around. It's true. What they'll do is they'll buy, what they'll do is they'll source candy bars and other things that have been aged out and they'll throw it through big grinders, but they won't take the packages off. Now, I'm not saying that this is everybody and I'm not saying this is even the big four in the U.S. There may be some regulations, but I know it's happening in the U.S. We've seen it. So they'll grind it up into an emulsification, right? Just a powder and then pelletize that and then feed it to the animals. So we are seeing microplastics making its way into our meat supply chain because now you're having a cow that's just eating, you have a a cow that's eating this feed that was cheap. You know, nobody's gonna sit there and take all these things out of the package, but it provides a ton of carbs, which is a lot of fat, and you fatten that animal and it's cheap feed, and now they can get it through and you can go buy McDonald's that ages for, you know, 40 years and never goes bad. (laughs) I don't think people realize the severity of what farmers went through in 2020 and why everybody needs to be fully awake to how fragile our food supply chain Mm -hmm. really is. You believe that we are talking about a matter of national food security. Absolutely. Yeah. It's definitely a a matter of national food security because like I said, when COVID happened and all these supply chains broke, people's meat supply chain, the the store shelves did go empty. Our national security... (laughs) There's this event in, in Soviet Russia called the Holodomor. It was in 1932 to 33. And what they did is 80% of their community back then, just ours was as well, they were food producers. They were food growers. Everybody had to grow their own food because you just couldn't go to the store and get it all. So you whatever your job was to make money, that was happening. And then you also had a job when you got home, which was taking care of your own garden or your own dairy cow or whatever that was, right? You had to provide some of your own uh, subsistence or you didn't have any, or you had to pay way more to get all of that. We're in a situation now where like the small town I'm in, it's small, uh, used to be small, 250,000 people, 4% of the food we eat there is grown locally, only 4%. 
So if you stop trucking for three days, your food shelves are empty and you've got nothing left to eat. It will not take very long for people to start looking for how am I going to get food? And if you have and they don't, they're going to come for you. That's just the reality of it. And they're going to do whatever it takes to get it. If they've got starving kids at home, they're not going to think about anything other than getting those kids fed, right? And that should scare everybody. It should scare everybody. You should know who your producer is. Like the one thing that you should know of your whole human beings need three things. Food, shelter, safety. I put water in with food. Food, shelter, safety. Food being number one. And we have become so comfortable. So everything is so convenient the majority of Americans, 99.9% of Americans, I promise you, don't even know where their most nece- uh, basic necessity is coming from, which is food. I don't care if it's, if you're a vegetarian and it's vegetables or you're a meat eater and it's meat. You don't know where it's coming from. Most people don't have a clue. And so when another pandemic happens, yep. what happens to our food supply chain? Yeah, well, so let's take Walmart, for example. Walmart earns one in four of our food dollars. So just think about that. One in every four dollars spent on food is spent at Walmart. And I met a gentleman who worked inside Walmart, didn't at the time of our meeting, but they had internal conversations that if the supply chain broke for them, just Walmart, our nation is out of food in three days. That's just one company. And other people are like, oh, well, we got Albertsons or Kroger's. Yeah, well, all of if one in four food dollars went to Walmart and then they have to shift you still have no food. So if we have a supply chain disruption, you will see mass starvation. You will see uh, people turning on each other to source the food that they need. You're going to see major uh, attempts to immigrate or to migrate north or wherever they think food might be. Matter of fact, there was a really great book called One Second After. Newt Gingrich used it in Congress to appeal to them to try to protect our infrastructure from an EMP. Because we did that during this, the the uh, um, Cold War. We protected everything from a possible uh, EMP electromagnetic pulse. And then we stopped because, you know, the threat's over. And so let's not do that anymore. In that book, they talk about, it took place, I think, in the Black Hills above Charlotte, North Carolina. That was the setting. EMP happens. Everything shuts down. People start migrating because there's this term, head for the hills, Right. So this thought is like, I need to get out of the city and I need to head for the hills. Well, you're talking about small populations. They don't have, let's talk Prescott, right? We're in Phoenix. If this happened in Phoenix and people started heading to Prescott, do you think Prescott can handle four and a half million migrants? Not even close. I, no. I, I For people that don't live in Arizona, which majority of my audience does it. Yeah. Very tiny town. Yes. And you're talking about a huge metropolitan city. Yeah. You're talking 5 million people moving in towards 10,000 people thinking, oh, they've got food up there. Well, they do, but not for you. <laughs> they got enough for their community. Right. You know, and and then a little bit to send out. And so we, because, so in 1980, Reagan changed the laws, the antitrust laws. This is what happened. In 1980s, the big four, it was different company names and there was more than four, but the conglomerates only controlled 25% of our nation's meat supply chain in the 80s. They changed the laws, and really all they looked at is as long as it doesn't affect you and your prices, so you don't monopolize and like make us pay out the nose, you guys can buy up, you can buy out this person, this person can buy, you can, you know, you guys can congregate and take over the world, basically, is what what their law changed to. And they did. We went from 25% under corporate control to now 85%. It's beef is a $64 billion industry. Only nine billion is shared between the small farms and ranchers around the nation. And they're closing at an alarming rate. And the ones that aren't closing are typically run by people in their 60s. And so if all of if the reality of ranchers in America basically dwindles to nothing, which is what's happening, Mm -hmm. if we have no local farmers and ranchers, it's all people just owned by these big four. How can they control and manipulate us? See, and that's the thing that scares me the most. Right. I'm a I'm a father. I've got three daughters. And my main concern is that they always have access to, to good food. If you, and this is what happened in, in Soviet Russia, so they conglomerated everything, put it all in, under under the, the government's control, and then they said, if you take anything, we will kill you, including your children. And they did. Three and a half million rural Ukrainians were murdered in genocide because the government took over and they dictated where it was going to go. Reading this, it's like reading the script for Hunger Games. I'm like, holy crap, this is like, you know, 
we were talking before we started like movies and how they manipulate and, and affect our real world. So they said, if you touch this food because it's for the government and you'll get issued your own share, then we're going to kill you. And then they locked off the borders so that these starving rural Ukrainians couldn't even leave and go find food. Like they, they locked them in and basically said, if you leave to go find food, we'll kill you as well. And so this is when we look at a tyrannical government in control of your most essential need as a human being, that is worst case scenario. And if we don't constantly keep pressure that that doesn't happen, we could easily see ourselves in that position. Just recently, COP28, the UN's major talking point was that America should reduce its meat consumption. That was a primary topic. Now, I'm hearing that it didn't make it to the table. I'm hoping that because myself and many others called attention to it, but as soon as we relax, as soon as we get complacent that we're okay, that's when it's going to when it's going to get us. We have to keep pressure always or whether it's an evil Mr. Burns in the top of the tower trying to take over or just the automatic the automatic necessity of being a corporation that's only focus is increase in margins. If we don't keep the pressure, we'll find ourselves in that way one way or another. It's like I said, 10,000 slaughterhouses, we're down to 2,500 across the whole country. 700,000 ranchers, we have less than 1% of our, maybe about 1% of our entire population are food growers, and that's it. And why is that? I, I guess I just don't get that. Mm -hmm. Is that just a, a, a sign of how culture is changing? Like people just don't go into mm. agriculture and yeah. farming. They don't, they don't understand it. Everybody's just working desk jobs or what? Great question. Um, that's a multifaceted question, but let me just say a couple of things. So if you grew up farming and ranching and you're a kid and it was a nightmare, maybe not a nightmare, but it was very inconvenient, right? Cause you got up when the sun, before the sun came up and you didn't go to bed till the sun was down and dad had you do these chores and mom needs you to do these chores. Like you kind of can't wait to get off the farm. However, you meet those people later on in life and they can't wait to get back on the farm. So that's one, right? Whatever their experience was growing up could affect that. The other thing is, uh, you know, out here at the West of town, there used to be farm fields everywhere and now it's all warehouses. So all of that food that we were, that was going somewhere in America is now coming from somewhere not in America, probably. And so that whoever that farming community was, they probably got a better offer because they couldn't make the finances work directly because there's no marketplace to sell direct. So they go sell it at wholesale. That's manipulated by the big guys. So they're barely making anything and they can't afford their property tax. They can't afford all of the increased fees for different you know, everybody's got their hand in the cookie jar and the producers are just paying money out everywhere. So financially doesn't make it. So the farm is more valuable selling it to somebody in development. So I can go and retire by selling this chunk of ground for millions of dollars versus fighting the headache that it doesn't seem like the population cares that I'm out here busting my ass to feed you. Speaking of farmers feeling like nobody cares, I'm reminded of, you know, all of these lawsuits from major companies that, you know, get mad about seeds and all of this. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, what I know of the seeds is the genetically modified seeds. So there was an instance in the U.S. where the neighboring farm was using Monsanto GMO corn and the other farmer was not. The seeds grew, and then the seeds blew over into this other farmer's land that was not using Monsanto's product. Monsanto sued that farmer and won because he was growing their seed on his land. In India, there's a woman named Vinda Shiva, and she has been fighting Monsanto with every ounce of energy, energy she's got because they're trying to move genetically modified products into that country and what she's pushing for is seed sovereignty we shouldn't have seeds that are owned the intellectual property is owned by a private organization why well because again it's control if if let's take fake meat right because that's what i know most it's the same situation happening there i think the biggest play happening is intellectual property on our food 
if I can vilify your naturally growing food so that the only thing you have an option on is lab grown or plant based meat that's an ingredient that I own the intellectual property on, then you have no choice but to buy what I'm selling. And that's what's going on. I think that's what's going on. I was so disturbed to hear about how some of these companies send, I mean, guys like dressed in black to go intimidate farmers and Mm -hmm. things like that about seeds. Mm -hmm. That stuff freaks me out. Yeah. And it's happening all over the world. It's like the mob. If you, if you look up, just do some research. I told you before we started, like I might need a security team. Do some research on JBS's ownership. It is the mob. It is the, it is a Brazilian mafia. They have been charged on major issues. Um, You can go and talk to indigenous people in the Brazilian uh, rainforest. They are, there are caballeros, the Brazilian cowboys, and there's not everybody. That's not all of them. Just like you can't say one thing about all of all the ranchers in the U S but they are clear cutting Brazilian rainforest to expand the ranching ground to raise beef. And they're murdering the indigenous people in the jungle because they're putting up a fight and they're disappearing. Now, JBS and other People sourcing from Brazil are claiming that they are tracking origins of where it's coming from because they're like, no, we don't do that. We're not we're not encouraging the Brazilian rainforest to be leveled. That's not it's just simply not true. There there are there's evidence that that is happening. Cargill just got in trouble recently, like a month ago, and articles were being written about Cargill's manipulation and control in areas that they're expanding soy production. You start looking into big ag and it's like a soap opera man the drama (laughs) is crazy there's murder there's intimidation Mm -hmm. it's terrifying yeah it is those things are all happening i've had people i've had people on the show that have been pro gmo anti-gmo raising the alarm saying it's not that big of a deal there's no evidence that it, it you know causes any harms to our health what's your personal opinion i don't think there's enough evidence so i'm just gonna go and eat regenerative beef like uh, there's not enough evidence. I mean, that look it's at, good. You're saying, yeah, that it's good for you, or that it doesn't leave any sort of trace elements. That's a problem, and that's because it is only what twenty years old. Yeah, it's twenty years old. I mean, look at uh, look at Monsanto and what's going on with glyphosate. Like glyphosate, they paid their researchers to show that there was no evidence of of problems with Roundup, which is glyphosate, but now. There are massive trials have happened over the last couple of years, and they can prove that glyphosate is a cause of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And they've been ordered to pay hundreds of millions of dollars to people that are suffering from non-Hodgkin's lymphoma who were groundskeepers at schools just spraying the weeds. This is why it is so crucial. Anything that you're buying, looking at those ingredients, you think, oh, it says wheat. It's healthy. Yeah. It's got to be organic. Yeah. So yeah. that And that's how we can guarantee that they're not spraying glyphosate on it. <laughs> yeah. Correct? Yeah. And that's not true, right? Because if you go to Europe, if you go to France, you can eat their bread and have no issues. But if you're celiac or anything like that in the U.S. and you eat bread here, it will destroy you. One of my children are celiac. And there's evidence that points to, you know, it's like, have you ever heard, well, we didn't have ADD when I was a kid, or we didn't have celiac when we were kids, or, you know, those those sayings are like, Nobody died of peanuts when I was in high school. The food changed. Everybody says, well, I ate goldfish crackers and I turned out fine. Look at the ingredients of uh, goldfish crackers 1996 versus goldfish crackers 2023. Exactly. Completely different product. Not the same. And you just see the brand and you think there's trust, there, inherent trust. And so you don't question, you grab it and take it home. And now you're eating poison literally. You just heard AJ talk about how important it is to be avoiding glyphosate in your food, but it doesn't stop with what you eat. This rule should extend to what feminine products we use as well, because what goes in those goes in us. And it's absorbed even faster down there than anywhere else. I mean, hello, that's why people like put their pills up their butts. I mean, not to be graphic, but like it freaking works. Garnu is a conservative owned feminine product brand that makes 100% organic cotton tampon pads and panty liners. No glyphosate should come near us, period. 
See what I did there? Garnu pads and tampons are made without dyes, chlorine, or fragrance. Even the tampon applicator that they use is BPA-free. By supporting real women and not buying into the delusion that men get periods, by picking better quality items to make their products, donating money from each purchase to end human trafficking in Nepal, and never donating to pro-choice causes, Garnu is a brand that has your back literally and figuratively as women. Join the girls only club this Christmas or join for someone else. How about a non-toxic stocking? Go to Garnu.com with code Alex for 15% off. That's G-A-R-N-U-U.com with code Alex for 15% off. Do a one-time purchase or set up Garnu to come monthly straight to your door so you never have to worry if you have what you need when strawberry week comes. I know what you're doing, stuffing your underwear with toilet paper, walking to CVS. We don't have to live that way. Find everything to try Garnu in the show notes if you forget our gut our micro gut biome is what a lot of people refer to as your first brain so you have this these microorganisms in your gut that based on what you're feeding your body will change your mood and your hormones right so i used to work in uh in health i had a crossfit gym here for eight years and then i coached a lot of people that had a lot of weight to lose um you know, they could, it could be anywhere from 20 pounds, but over a hundred pounds that they needed to lose. And so I did a lot of studying into nutrition and, and mental health and so forth. A lot of mental health that we're dealing with is from our food. It's in, it's, it's what we're putting into our body. So it's how your stomach is interacting with your brain and it sends signals to your brain. And so just imagine you got all these little creatures in your stomach and you feed it junk and now they're pissed. They're going to make you regret that you did that. You don't know that's why you're feeling depressed or anxious or all these other issues, but it's the food that you gave your gut. Is it a strategy from the government to make accessibility to whole local food complicated and harder? I don't know that I would put the blame entirely on the government. The government is is, I believe, implicated. And I think they're implicated through lobbyists, right? That's where that problem comes to a head. You've got big ag is the lead generator for big pharma. Okay. So a lot of people listening right now, AJ, have mm-hmm. never heard this term big ag. They hear me okay. talk about big food. They big don't food. know that Same there's thing. anything negative in agriculture. Could yeah, you yeah. expand so, on that? Yep. Big food is big ag. It's the same thing. So industry talk is agriculture or ag, right? Uh, big food would be the everyday person if you say big food. So it's the same one in the same. Okay. So I think that there is a direct connection between the pharmaceutical industry and what they're peddling and big ag and what they're peddling. How so? If I can make you sick with what you're eating on a daily basis, I've got the solution. And that's antidepressants. That's Ozempic, the shot to make you not overweight so you can eat all the food you want, but now is causing other major health issues, which, you know, surprise, surprise. So if I can make you sick off your everyday consumption, I'm going to try to sell you on the idea. I'm going to make you healthy, but you got to take these pills the rest of your life. If you're given a antidepressant with no path to not having to be on that antidepressant at some point, you're in the system. They don't care. They're not trying to get you healthy. Why? Because a healthy person doesn't need to buy antidepressants every month. Yep. You know, we went through it in our house and it, a lot of that changed when we changed our food. We drink raw milk. We, my wife makes homemade bread. We source all of our meat uh, from people that we know. So I can say, how did you finish this animal? What did you give it? What was, you know, how was it raised? That's how we do it at my house. And our family's lives are way better for it. We got to legalize raw milk. Yes. Why do they want us to not be able to get that? I think it goes back to what I was saying a minute ago about if you are sick and complacent, you're controllable. I can sell you all kinds of stuff. But is regular milk that we've been drinking forever, 2% milk, whole milk, vitamin D milk, is there even any nutrients in that pasteurized milk whatsoever? Is it just like drinking water? No, I think there are some nutrients, but I think you're missing so many of the nutrients that you get out of raw that you're not expressing the full benefits of drinking raw milk. What's the true story on why they have told us for so many decades that raw milk is dangerous for human consumption? You know, I don't know why they're doing that. I would assume based on everything I'm researching and finding in the in the big food supply chain that it goes back to control. 
Because look, if you have to pasteurize your milk to sell it, that's a pretty big investment. Whereas if I have a cow and I'm selling you milk, my investment's the cow and its feed, and that's it. So you, every single person around you could get their own cow and have their own cheese, their own... I mean, you the amount of food you could feed your family on your own dairy cow, right? Or having a neighbor that has that, because it's a lot of work, so it's better to source it if you're busy. You are almost self-sufficient in a worst case scenario on that because of the protein, because of all the nutrients that come out of that. But if I tell you, you now have to have pasteurized milk because raw milk is illegal, then all of the equipment it would take, like the person I buy my raw milk from would probably stop because there would be no financial benefit of investing that much money into becoming a pasteurized operation. Um, there, I, there's so much to research. I wish I had more details for you, but Harry Pasteur, I think his name was, was the person who did the research on this, like in the thirties, I believe. Yeah. And wasn't it like they, they for a time and in cities, um, they had to keep cows in like yucky, dingy industrial yes. warehouses or something. And, yeah. and they were standing and sitting and eating garbage. And yes. so they had to make the milk safe. And so that's how we got this pasteurization. And it's something that we don't even really need anymore. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we 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 shouldn't. This should not even be a conversation. There should be re regulations for the people providing uh, raw milk. Regulations in terms of cleanliness rules and things like that, so that you can be a confident buyer. How come some states it's legal and some states it isn't? And how do we get all states to legalize raw milk? I think it's leadership. You know, you got some states that are left leaning versus some states that are right leaning, and the right leaning states are more likely to have ways to get raw milk versus states that are left leaning good luck like they'll put you in jail they'll they'll pull up and if you're drinking raw milk next to the guy who's shooting heroin you're going to jail and he's getting some snacks you know, you know it's, it's crazy and it is it's leadership whatever that leadership leans into is what's going to manifest itself in the community so the two conversations have to happen is one the consumer most of the people listening to this podcast need to take responsibility for how you're sourcing your food like if you want it to be there you should start paying attention to where it's coming from. And a lot of people I will say, it's so expensive, I can't afford to buy direct. Guess what? What you're paying in medical costs now and certainly what you'll pay in medical costs later is far more expensive than cutting out going out and drinking on a weekend or the cigarettes or the cannabis or the Netflix account or, I mean, you name it. There are so many things that we choose as consumers to spend our money on that we now look at really high quality, nutrient dense food and say, that's too expensive. No, it's not. That's going to be what keeps you uh, a healthy, functioning human being as you age. That's not, that's an investment. So that's, that's the consumer's responsibility. Do a little bit of work and pay a little bit of extra money to get high quality food, right? So what do you say to these people that are in ag and, you know, that's the, those are the messages that I get for pushback anytime I talk about this. Well, mm -hmm. you have no idea what you're talking about. My family wouldn't eat if my husband didn't farm yes. corn and soy and, yeah. and et cetera. Yeah. And so on that other side, you know, I've, I've stepped in some hornet's nests where I've called out some things that are real, that are true. Like, like I said, what? two things can be true. Well, feedlot beef. Regenerative beef is healthier for you and it's healthier for the environment, period. No argument. And then somebody who does beef in a feedlot gets mad because I didn't acknowledge that the feedlot beef, you know, is necessary. Feedlot beef is necessary. We have too many Americans to feed. We've broken the system for so long. It's going to be 20 years or more if we started today before we could get away from a feedlot method. It's just necessary. But if I speak highly of regenerative beef, the people with the feedlots get pissed because I didn't, you know, but the facts are the facts. The other side of that too is if you are uh, looking for those subsidies, you're on welfare. It's just labeled different. What do you mean? Meaning. If you're only growing what you're automatically getting paid for versus what you know your community needs, they've got you in their control, right? I know there, and, and listen, I've got a bleeding heart for every agricultural producer out there. So people are going to hate me for this and people are going to love me for this because they're ma they've made the change. But if you have our country, here's what I'm, here's what I'm about. I'm about the consumer making sure you have food. Because if my neighbors are fed, then my family's safe. And I'm about that our agricultural producers get the 
respect that they deserve. Doesn't mean everybody's doing it in a way that works for us right now, but there's an opportunity for that. And so I will say what's necessary to move the needle the direction that it needs to go so that my family, my kids, everybody else listening to this, if they have kids, that your kids have food. If we don't change what's happening now, our kids will be way sicker than we've ever seen in human history. I mean, already they are already our life expectancy is shorter than the generation before us. And it's the first time in history that the kids are going to die younger than the parents because of what they're eating. And so I'll just say what I what I feel, what AJ's opinion is based off of what I spend my entire day doing is to solve those issues. And that is the more people that buy direct starts lifting an industry. Think about, let's take Airbnb as an example, right? If you wanted to rent a short-term property prior to Airbnb, all of the steps that went in place, all the marketing efforts that you'd have to do, all of the money that would be put towards those efforts, like it wouldn't make sense to go buy a home and throw it on an Airbnb market because it would take too much work. Airbnb comes along, creates a marketplace that you now literally just have to show up and there's somebody waiting, right? So they lifted an industry. Now, what's happening recently or lately or how that's been manipulated, I'm not speaking of that. I'm speaking of the concept when it first started. Great idea. I loved Airbnb. If we do the same thing with our food supply chain, if our focus is who are we going to meet and shake the hand so that we can know who they are, now we've created a stable food supply chain. The best case scenario for a rancher if he's sitting on his horse trailing the cattle in front of him and every one of those have a family's name to it, that's stability. That rancher now knows every one of these has a home. They know I'm raising this for Alex Clark. This is her beef. It's going to feed her and her family. Now you have helped that person that's providing your food create a stable business. On the other side, you now know, you can go about your, your life, your day, doing the things that you're passionate about, knowing that your most needed, uh, you know, commodity, food, is handled. That's a, that's a best case scenario. But um, a mentor of mine says that God gives us blessings and they usually come with a first and last name, right? So when Alex Clark's name belongs to that cow, that's a blessing to that rancher. And when your ranching and Anchor Brand Ranch is the name you think of, you know, Ramsey Hughes, it's my cousin. That is a blessing to you because you know they've got you taken care of and you can focus on the things that you're trying to change because I mean, that's why I'm sitting here at Turning Point is this is an organization that's trying to shift things in a way that makes it better for all of us. And Unless we stand in that space and really put those first and last names to work and really lean into those, we're just going to have a system that doesn't work. Have you ever heard of the bucket theory? The bucket theory is that we're all born with a certain size bucket. Our genetics determine how full the bucket we all start with is to begin with, with toxins, depending on how we're born, like C-section versus vaginal, what our moms ate while pregnant, if we're breastfed versus not, et cetera. And then what we are eating after we're born, what we're exposed to after we're born, all of that adds to this toxin bucket as we age. At some point, some earlier than others, our buckets will overflow. This is why changing out everyday products to be non-toxic actually does make a huge difference. So I switched to Bum Roll Toilet Paper, a premium eco-friendly toilet paper that's 100% recycled, free of chlorine, free of perfumes, free of PBA, and free of plastic wrap. And they help support American jobs in the USA by manufacturing here in America with U.S. and North American materials. If you have difficulty concentrating, mood swings, lack of energy, trouble sleeping, tiredness, feel bloated, live or work around environmental pollutants, and routinely experience digestive discomfort, that's a sign that your toxic load is full. Everything in moderation, in my opinion, is terrible advice. More like make as many little changes as you can with every day. Excuse me, I had to burp. <laughs> More like make as many little changes as you can by switching out everyday products. Go to joinbumroll.com with code Alex for $3 off your first shipment. That's joinbumroll.com with code Alex for $3 off your first shipment or click the link in the show notes. Thank <laughs> you.
I think that's the biggest aha moment I'm going to take from this interview is you saying you keep your neighbors fed so that you keep your family safe. We have to care about the food that we're eating for our community as a whole, not even just our immediate family, because when it all goes to hell, which inevitably will, Mm -hmm. they're going to kill you because you know where to get food. Yeah, they will. It's I mean, listen. Look what's happening. It it is not a far reach. Look what's happening in the cities that have become completely corrupted. People are getting murdered every single day for the simplest things. Yep. Now take mass starvation on a large scale, on a city level scale. I have goosebumps. It's carnage. It it really is. And, and that's not, it is not far off. It, it, it happened before. It'll happen again. We're on our way to that exact path. And if we if we don't wake up right now and you lean in to your food supply chain and you start shaking the hand that feeds you all across this nation we will see this again and now we're talking you know three and a half million people starved to death in ukraine in 1932 to 33 what is our population now if it was today's population then it would be in the hundreds of millions, most likely. Wow. Not necessarily in Ukraine, but take the U.S. If we have a U.S. experience of the Holodomor, and they are working feverishly to vilify our natural food. Is there an indoctrination going on with the processed food industry to make people think that it's impossible, it's completely unaffordable to get healthy or organic food? I don't know that they're they're the ones feeding into that. I think, well, I mean, look, we used to spend Eight percent of our budget on healthcare and thirty percent on our food. Now we probably spend eight percent on our food and well over thirty on our healthcare. Well, and compared to other countries, Americans spend the least amount on food because yeah. we don't care where we're eating. Like w- when I say spend the least, like we're going to the cheapest options, we're getting fast food or whatever. We don't care about it. It is so low on our priority list compared to all the other countries, especially in Europe. And you see the health, mm-hmm. you see the health problems. Oh my gosh, yeah. It, and you don't have to look that hard. You land into another country and it's like, a clear difference in the health of the people. Talk about how so much of our entire diet as Americans consists of just processed food. Oh my gosh. I mean, if I said to the people on, on listening to this, go to your kitchen and open up your cupboards and then open up your fridge. Where's the majority of your food sitting? If it's sitting in the cupboards, you're killing yourself. If it's not in the fridge, staying fresh or in the freezer, that's you're eating highly processed food. So when you say, is there a concerted effort towards manipulating that? I don't think necessarily it's profit driven. So if I can make super cheap food for you, then you're going to go the cheap route because I mean, listen, when, when everything is more expensive and you still like to have a life, it's like, if I buy the macaroni and cheese, I can go out with my friends because life sucks. Things are really hard right now. So at least I get that reprieve on the weekend, but it's a vicious cycle. I have a friend that uh, regenerative rancher in Ten Sleep, Wyoming. And he says, what's the value of a good idea? What would you put the value of a good idea on? And so what he's saying is, if you're feeding your body highly nutritious, nutrient-dense food, so those micro gut biome is thriving and your brain is firing on all cylinders, what's the value of that? When you say that that's too expensive, well, if you are not happy with your life, if you're stuck somewhere and you wish you could get out, you have to look inward first. And that's your food. So many things here I, I've got to ask. Number one, one of the first things people will say is, well, organic food isn't real. Mm. That it's a fake label. It's all a marketing scheme. There's no such thing as organic. Mm-hmm. What is your response? That's true. But it's changed. Just like the ingredients have changed, so has the term organic. And right now we're seeing regenerative be bastardized by the big ag, big food corporations. At COP28, if you hear if you hear one of these big brands talk about regenerative agriculture and how they're regener- regenerative, it's probably a 90% uh, fact that it's, they're lying. Okay, well, see, now what, how do you know if your food is actually organic or not or actually regeneratively grown or made or not? Ask Farmer John. That's my point. That's the thing. You have if to you know shake who the their person hand, is. You can say, how is it done? Mind blown. To make it easy, if it's a label, it's a lie. If it's coming from Farmer John, that's more reliable. So organic means nothing anymore. They have ruined that. They've manipulated. So 
being in the meat meat industry, right in the in the slaughterhouse, label laws are a big deal. So if you buy meat from the store right now and it says product of the USA, it's not. What do you mean? <laughs> yeah, it's probably not. So we used to have this law called MCOOL, Mandatory Country of Origin Labeling. Canada and Mexico whined because it was discriminatory, discriminatory. And so they repealed that law. So now if you provide any further value to a product, it can be labeled product of the USA. So what does that mean? Packaging it. Packaging. Comes I from somewhere it, else entirely, but I just put it on styrofoam in the yes, US. I took it from a whole half a cow. I cut it into a steak. Now I added value to that ribeye. So now I'm going to label it product of the USA, but it came from Uruguay. The other thing, we didn't finish this when we talk about the climate impact. A single super tanker on the ocean is equal to 40,000 cars on the highway. So it's not the cow, it's the how. When we're importing 900 million pounds of beef from other countries, not counting the, in, the, in the lamb and sheep industry, 75% of lamb and sheep sold in the United States is foreign. So it, it's, I mean, it's, it's so corrupt, but they're shipping all of this over, which is contributing all of these emissions that we're worried about. It's not the cow. It is how you got it here. So that's the one thing. So then it gets here. It's in a big chunk, and then they cut it into smaller pieces. It goes through a packaging machine, and they stick a sticker on it that says USA. So if you go to the store right now and you see a sticker that says USA, it's probably not from here. Okay, so what about stickers that say USDA organic or non-GMO? So USDA organic or non-GMO, again, do you know Farmer John? Did you ask him? Like I just live. It's convicting. What you're oh, yeah. saying is convicting. Like it makes me defensive, yes. but I'm I'm yes. listening to yes. you and I'm trying to keep an open mind. And I'm just thinking about like, dude, you're right. Yes. Because I don't know, because you know what else is that I've been thinking like, you know, going to Whole Foods, for example, I've got better options there. But now Whole Foods, they're embracing appeal. Yes. Right. Talk about <laughs> right. appeal. How yeah. do you feel about the appeal label now from Bill Gates Man. on our fruit? I just I just go back to like if it's got anything on it, it's because it came from somewhere so far away that wasn't natural or supposed to be in that area at that time. So they give it a shelf life. And we don't know the full impact of that. Like, why are we testing? Why are we testing the limits of what our bodies can do in the wrong way, which is process junk instead of what if we gave it real food from Farmer John and then what our bodies can do from that standpoint, right? So yeah, appeal, like I'm not touching appeal like especially where it came from anything in the gates or they just bought out the Bragg's apple cider vinegar well they've they've now bastardized Bragg's apple cider vinegar because Gates found uh, the Gates conglomerate owns apple cider vinegar from Okay Bragg's. but here's the thing about the Bragg's apple cider vinegar yeah. is if it's if if it's a whole like t- situation that works, meaning that people buy this product, they love it. I mean, is it in Bill Gates's best interest to change that ingredient list or recipe? Like, are they going to do anything to it? You think or keep it? I think that uh, it's in anybody's best interest that has a corporation to maximize profits. So what's going to happen? Like, Bill Gates is going to be using appeal apples to make the Bragg's apple cider vinegar. Well. The appeal is just the coating on the outside. So they're probably not that. I mean, maybe, but it might get diluted. It might have other things added to it to to maybe make it stretch longer. Those kinds of things. Right. When you're a when you're buying from a like I'm a I'm a capitalist. I believe in starting companies that have true values and and being rewarded for the hard work and the success of those things. Um, But when you know that person directly, you're going to be able to or, or I should say when that organization is run by a mom and pop or somebody who put their heart and soul into it, it's going to be run different than a line item on a spreadsheet of where they're trying to make more revenue. Right. Okay. So we have to talk, we have to talk more about this organic thing. (laughs) Okay. If your food is coming locally, does it matter if you know the person making it, like what you're talking about, Farmer John, if you know who is, who's doing the farming and ranching, does it matter if they say that they're an organic farmer or not, or should you be looking for that, your local organic farmer? I, that's a regional question. Like when you're in Arizona, the amount of producers in your state cannot nearly support the amount of consumers that are here. Okay. Right. So I have So like, I'm going to have to make exceptions. Oh yeah, you should. I mean, you have to. Okay. Right. I mean, a big part of what we're doing where I'm at is focusing on supporting Phoenix because I'm from here. I know the limitations that are here. Now I'll do everything I can to connect people with local producers first, because that's always best source locally. Because if shipping isn't working, you want to know who that person is. But 
you guys will sell out your local farm state when I say local state farmer and ranchers in a heartbeat. Okay, so let's just say pinch scenario, yeah. you know, I don't have a local farmer or rancher yet. I have to go to the store and 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 get some um asparagus. Yep. If your option is organic and not organic, are you going to choose the organic one or no? I will, yes. Okay. I'll, but but what I'll do is I'll go look up the name of the brand. Okay. Yeah, they they got a label. So if you go to Whole Foods, do take a second. I mean, you're talking about your body. Take what a are you second. Googling? I'm looking up the the label. And I'm lo- I, so I'm I'm googling the name of the label, right? And it usually goes to a place that has a conglomerate of producers, so they can source enough for Whole Foods, as an example. Uh, Whole Foods used to carry a friend of mine, Will Harris. He owns uh, White Oaks Pastures in Atlanta. Um, when they first went regenerative, they sourced from from him. Well, then they pulled him because Amazon uh, uh, they bought Whole Foods. And so they chain, you know, they've got to maximize profit. So they kicked him out. And now he's like, be wary. I don't know what they're selling. They're still saying it's from White Oaks Pastures. I don't think that they do anymore. But for a while, they claimed it was White Oaks Pastures beef. And it wasn't. He goes, I haven't sold to these guys in over a year. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so let me just like a couple rapid okay. fire brand names. I just want to see like you like them or not. Yep. Alexander Farms. I don't know Alexander Farms, but I probably should. Uh, It's like A2 milk and Oh, yeah. If it's stuff. A2, A2, great milk. Great. Yep. Okay. Vital Farms eggs. They, Vital Farms, phenomenal. Yep. Okay. Because I pick the regenerative. Yep. Well, I have been historically picking the regenerative eggs, yep. but now I'm going to find somebody to get me local eggs from you. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, Okay. So those are two brands that come to mind. What about that butter brand It's and yogurt? It's like maple. I think it's like Maple Hill Organic or something like I that. I don't know about them. Don't know them. No, I would, I would look that up for Any sure. Any that come on the top of your mind that you're like, these are great brands if you have to shop in the grocery store? Uh, in the grocery store. Let's see. Who would I think? Vital Farms is probably in the Whole Foods area, the only place I know of that's selling on a large enough scale. I don't know. Um, we buy the A2 milk when we don't have it locally. Like if we're traveling, we'll buy that A2 one half gallon. Yep. To be honest with you, I don't know much about okay. the farm, but I know A2 is better. The A2 protein in milk is better for you. Yes. Um, and, like a lot of people mm-hmm. that are, they think they're lactose intolerant. They switch to A2 or raw milk yep. and they're fine. They're like, exactly. oh, I'm not lactose intolerant. It's because of the crappy milk that you've yeah, been drinking. It's the protein in that. It's the A1 protein, not the A2 is the problem. Yes. Um, but really, as I think about walking through the grocery store, I haven't been there for a while because I buy my stuff from the people <laughs> I know. Yeah, really. But uh, Vital Farm, when I go buy eggs, I buy eggs a lot because it's hard to find eggs all the time. Vital Farms is what I buy. So if you're buying eggs at the store, buy Vital Farms. Depending on what store you're at, if you're at a Trader Joe's or a Whole Foods, I bet you they've got some great partners in there. But just take a second, do some research on the brand label, and then buy. You know, a lot of this food that we do consume, They here's the thing. The food we do consume here does come from our American farms and ranches. Most of those guys are doing exactly what they should be doing at their farm. The issue is what happens when it changes hands. So when they hand that off, it's the process from that point on that gets manipulated for maximizing profit. People think that it is going to cost an arm and a leg for them to shop from their local farmers and ranchers, that it's absolutely impossible that the average American family, even single income family, cannot afford to eat not primarily processed food. Is that true or a lie? It's a lie. And it depends on what you're sourcing or how you're sourcing it. So, for example, if you buy, a lot of ranchers would like to sell quarter halves and holes. That means it's a whole animal. If you buy a quarter, let's say it's 100 pounds, half, 200 pounds, whole, 400 pounds. But you have to have a deep freeze to store that. But that makes the process for the producer so simple that it can be a lot cheaper. And what a lot of people do is they'll they'll find another family, your neighbor or whatever, yeah. or an, a family member or someone at church, and they'll say, hey, we want to go in on a cow. Yep. You buy half, I buy half, and you save so much money that way. And then that meat lasts somebody, I mean, yes. like a whole year or more. Oh, yeah. We have a family of four. We bought a whole animal last August, and I still probably have 50 pounds. So that right there, not going to the grocery store multiple times a month to buy meat, you've got to be cutting costs. Yeah. I think we paid $3,500 for... 400 to 450 pounds of meat, including the packaging and everything. And it's, uh, I know where it came from. I know everything I need to know about it. I know that it's in my freezer. So if I need it, it's right there. 
Um, yeah, that's the best way to do it. You can also, if you're on a budget, there's something I'm really trying to teach people. If you're on a budget and, and cause right now t- things are really hard for a lot of people, you should buy what's called a cull cow. It means it's an animal that is no longer doing what its na- normal job was. So if it's a female, they call them a heifer. If it's a heifer or a female cow that's having birthing calves and then gets to a certain age that it no longer does that. Well, they can't keep feeding it, so it goes into the food supply chain. If you call and ask your local farmer and rancher for their cull, C-U-L-L, that's going to be a much cheaper animal because it's basically just ready to be retired. Now, they're usually not good for anything other than ground beef, but man, if you're hungry and you want healthy food, we eat ground beef more than anything in our house anyway because of the versatility. You well, know? I also just try to explain to people the stuff in the middle of the grocery store is not necessary. And this is what is driving up yep. the cost of your organic food. You don't need it. Yeah. You need the meat. You need bread, which you can make on your own. You need eggs, sauces you can make yourself, you know, without all the crap in them. Because even a lot of organic snacks or organic uh, dressings and things, they still have seed oils and all this other crap. Yes. It's so, so it's so important. You just, it takes time. And mm-hmm. that's the thing is people idolize convenience to the point that they put it above their health. Yes. Yeah. And whole foods like meat specifically gets used as a loss leader sometimes. So for example, uh, a local producer would not be able to compete with the price of that a local burger joint is paying for their burger if the burger joint was just looking for the cheapest. Why? Because Cisco, that they're sourcing all their other materials from, Cisco will come to you as the burger joint and say, I'm going to sell you ground beef at $1.50 a pound, but I'm marking up your utensils 400%. So they use it as a loss leader. I get in the door with you and you're going to buy my chemicals and my silverware and all these other things. And so how does a producer compete with a wage or a price that is manipulated by these other options that they're offering. This week, I'm hosting my friend and her husband in my apartment. I'm not going to be there. I'm going to be somewhere else, but I'm letting them stay while they're visiting. And so because of that, I've been spending so much time getting my apartment deep cleaned and ready for guests. One thing that I think is important when you're hosting is to make sure that everything a guest may need is easy to find. I like to put together a few toiletries like an extra toothbrush, razor, floss, and body wash. Obviously, I am giving them the ultimate luxury experience of trying my my Olivia Organic Prebiotic Body Wash. Since it is the holidays, I'm going to be leaving them with Olivia's cranberry scent. There's only eight non-toxic, non-GMO ingredients from the land and the sea in this body wash. There is no artificial scents or fragrance. And the fact that Olivia body washes are prebiotic is top tier and something you will not find easily somewhere else. Now, what does that mean? Why does it matter? A prebiotic body wash feeds your skin's microbiome. It helps your skin absorb the maximum amount of healing and skin soothing hydration and healing ingredients to help with things like eczema, scars, burns, psoriasis, and more. You can use Alivia Body Wash on anyone, including infants, and on anything like hair and face. I even like to use it for cleaning my makeup brushes. Go to Alivia.com, use code Alex15 for 15% off. That's Alivia.com with code Alex15 for 15% off or find the link in the description. Pro tip, they make travel sizes, which are so cute for stockings. I had this mom like super angry with me in my DMs yesterday. And she was like, well, if it wasn't for hamburger helper, my family would have nothing to eat. And I said, what did your ancestors eat before hamburger helper? Yeah. Now, is it harsh? I guess. (laughs) But it's like, it's the truth. We don't need this stuff, it's not food. And yes. that's the thing that I, I it, it's like, a, it's an educational gap is that people don't understand that it's, they're like, well, it's cheaper. And so that helps my family survive or whatever. But I'm like, but you're not eating food. It's not right. food to begin with. No. If I gave you a cardboard box and said, eat this, yep. that's essentially what you're doing. And it's like, well, the cardboard yep. box is cheaper, but you wouldn't eat that because you see that it isn't food. Right. It's just that it's all manipulated. It looks like food, but it isn't. Yeah. The fact is you're poisoning your kids and that sucks because that's not your intention. It's not their intention. No. And that's the thing. We're not saying that you're a bad mom. I'm saying like we're giving you people yes. don't have the knowledge. If we no. give you the knowledge, like now you, <laughs> you're you a bad mom. If you hear this information and you don't make the change, Yes, you have been manipulated. It's marketing. You've been marketed to and sold on this idea that you can feed your family for cheap. 
and you can feed them for cheap, but you can't provide sustenance for them for cheap. There's a difference. Like I can have a full bill. I mean, there are people that will eat. I saw a documentary where the moms in this African community were mixing mud in with the food to make it go further because they didn't have enough. Well, that isn't sustenance. You're not eating for help. You're eating to survive. Some people might be there. They might be there in our country where they are literally just eating to survive. My heart goes out to you. But for others who are just complacent, like that's where my problem is. If that's you're just my being, problem. Yeah. If you're being complacent and you just want to bitch about something, screw you. You're poisoning your kids. What are your other, like, show me your budget. Do you dare to show me your budget and then tell me that the food is too high? Because if I go through your budget and I see uh, an, an Apple streaming and a Netflix streaming and a HBO streaming and, a, you know, your whatever you spent in alcohol. I mean, these other things. It, it, it takes reprioritizing. Yes. Number one. But the other thing is that I try to tell people is that you are probably spending more on groceries when your your diet primarily consists of processed food because it doesn't make you full. It doesn't That's actually, right. it, it, so you have to eat more to feel full. So you're spending more money. Let me tell you something. Yeah. Until a year ago, AJ, we would have never been having this conversation. Oh, really? I was the chicken nugget princess. Uh, my <laughs> entire diet, my entire life was primarily processed. I didn't know any of this. I didn't want to know it. I thought it was stupid. Mm -hmm. And then I was radicalized during the pandemic. <laughs> And then I understood. I'm like, why do I see corruption in all these other areas of our government? And I'm refusing to look at big food. Mm. It, it all made sense to me. Yeah. So so that's what woke me up. But what I'm saying is I snacked all the time, all day long. I was always snacking, having to go through a drive through on my way home or whatever. Mm -hmm. I never I was always hungry. You're never satiated. As yeah. soon as I changed my diet and I started eating whole real foods for all aspects of my meal, I am so fine eating two or three meals a day. I don't need anything else. I don't need right. to snack no. because I I'm getting such nutrient dense food when I do eat a meal. Yep. Yep. And then you have things like uh, intermittent fasting. I do really well on intermittent fasting. So I'll eat one meal a day. It'll get all my calories in that day, but it's all really highly nutrient dense food that I eat one time a day. And then I feel great, you know, and that's in the evening. I wake up the next morning and I might have like a, you know, a, a coffee or whatever to get started. But I, f I function really well. I feel great. And I'm literally just eating one meal a day. You know, if I, I think back to our ancestors prior to globalization where we were, get, everything was so convenient for us. Right. And I think back to the, the, the pastoralists, the people that went out and raised food on a natural, uh, on a day, right. They weren't home. They woke up. They maybe had something that was left over from dinner and they put probably a little bit in their knapsack. So they it was with them while they were out moving their animals around or whatever it was they were doing. And then they went home and had their meal at dinner. They didn't eat all day long or snack throughout the day, but they had really nutritious, nutrient dense food when they ate it. If, you know, of course, depending on where you lived and that sort of thing. But I mean, my family, when I look at the, what, what it took for them to settle the Arizona strip in 1916, like we're talking some of the harshest environment and they had to self-sustain. They could dry farm corn and cotton and potatoes and those kinds of things, but they provided for themselves with the meat and they did great. And they didn't have clinics and hospitals on every freaking corner. I mean, look at, <laughs> just look at our, just drive through your neighborhood and count how many medical offices exist. Oh yeah. If we, if you, if you just wipe those out, just, snapped your fingers and they disappeared and you kept today's, you know, health, what would we see? We would probably see a major collapse in mental health and all of these other things that are being just barely kept going by the drugs they're given. Yeah. You rewind years ago, you didn't have this many medical, you had a hospital for emergencies if you were lucky, you know, that may be close by, but otherwise everything was a home remedy or not necessary because you were healthy enough, metabolically healthy enough that you could handle the crap that came your way. Can you talk about what the phrase pasture raised really means mm. and how nobody checks? <laughs> yeah. Nobody's going to these farms to make sure that the animals are really pasture raised, yes. correct? Yes. There's a lot of corruption going on oh, there. Man. Talk about so that. Much. Well, and it's like you said, can you trust organic? It's the same thing. It's a label. If there, if it's on the label, you should always just question it. Unless again, you know the person. So pasture raised in a lot of places, like like chickens, for example, if a chicken is born inside and raised inside and it only knows inside and you open these doors and claim that they've got access to pasture, 
they're not going outside. I mean, look at look at our kids now. If your kids have an iPad and an Xbox and a PlayStation and a computer, and you're like, there's the door. <laughs> We're pasture-raised. We're pasture-raised. Well, my kids have access to pasture, but are they going outside? Hell no, because they they don't know that environment. There's nothing for them out there that okay, they're so aware Okay, so for people who are like, well, I don't really care. Like, I'm not an animal person. Like, it doesn't matter to me if my chicken gets to walk on grass yeah. or not. Um, from a nutritional <laughs> perspective, why it should it matter? Yeah, well, because if they're not on grass, they're not connected to the earth. And I believe in energy, too. I think everything has an energy. I think there's a lot that, you know, if you ever touched a, maybe you haven't, but if you ever touched a, a radio and you can hear, like, you can touch the antennas, like, and like something's ha- your 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 body emits an electromagnetic energy, right? This earthing grounding. I believe in all that. I stuff. believe in all of yeah. it too, baby. It's, it's, it's <laughs> all legitimate. Right. Yeah, it's all legitimate. And Walking so, barefoot on the ground so important for our health. But right. that's a whole other episode I could do. So if you don't care that your chicken isn't walking around, there's other implications that are happening. And so I also believe in karma as an energy, right? So if you're eating an animal that grew up in confine, confinement and was not happy. That will express itself, even if you can't measure it, like with any sort of modern device in your life, right? Also, the inability to resource its own natural foods, like eat grass or scratch at worms or any of those kinds of things, that's not in its diet. So now you're getting an animal that isn't getting its essential diet, just like we're talking about for us. We are what we eat, right? So if you look at somebody that's eating a diet that is way out of balance, it expresses itself. It's the same for animals. And so then you go and consume that animal and now you've got that problem that you're carrying into yourself. Now, the other thing about free range and all that kind of stuff is there's a difference too in how animals are, the chickens are raised. It's like, some of them, they have this one little patch of grass or something like that. And then other ones, they like move it around. Yes, yeah. What am I describing? I'm horrible. Yeah, no, you're describing... uh, rotational grazing. Yes. That's regenerative agriculture. Okay, that's regenerative agriculture. Yeah. And and why what do they do special with chickens in regenerative agriculture? Oh man, there's a there's a guy's name's Paul. I don't know his last name, but Pasture Bird. This guy's a former Marine. Sorry, Marines. Once a Marine, always a Marine. Uh no experience in agriculture at all. And he his story's awesome. He said they were just joking and all of a sudden his brother about raising their own chickens. And his brother comes walking back in or brother-in-law and says I just ordered 50 chickens. They're on their way. And he's like, what? And so they hurried and set up for this whole deal. Well, now they have partnered with Purdue. Purdue is making a commitment to transforming their agricultural practices for their chicken. So I'm not saying all Purdue Wait, this is kind of good news. It is great news. Oh, I didn't know this. When I first heard he partnered, I was like, you sold out. So this would be a brand to look for, possibly. Yeah, Pasture Bird. Look for Pasture Bird. I'll, I'll promote those from as long as Paul's involved. I'm going to tell you to check out Pasture Bird. So, so Purdue gets involved, and because of their capital investment, they now built this massive 7,000 square foot solar powered chicken coop that moves around the pasture on its own. So those chickens are on fresh like grass. Wheels? Yes, they're on fresh grass every 24 hours. And and so that is special because some of these pasture raises, like they're always in the same patch of grass, gets yeah. worn down. And- yeah, yeah. And so those that know better, they know that, first of all, the, the manure from chicken is huge in nitrogen. So when we talk about food security, 60% of the world's nitrogen, I might be off on that number, comes from Russia. Well, what's going on in Russia and Ukraine right now? 30% of the world's grain supply comes from Ukraine. So now uh, fertilizer is a, when we talk about centralization, like we can go so deep in all these things because we were just talking about the food itself. Well, what about the stuff that we now rely on to grow the food? The other thing is with that soil and regenerative agriculture, all of that also affects like our water system and everything. Well, a 1% increase in soil organic matter will hold 20,000 gallons of water when it rains. So where I live, there are these stupid water harvesting laws, meaning you can't catch rainwater. I can catch 2,500 gallons on my parcel. And anyway, I won't go into that, but there, I, I just heard a rumor that by 2030, which is an interesting date, they are going to ban all pumping in this region if the aquifer doesn't rise. What does that mean for, for people that have no idea about this world? Yeah, so the water aquifer, that's the underground water supply. That's where... 
if you're not if you're not in a city and drinking recycled sewer water, if you're in the country at least, you're probably drinking water that comes from underground, the aquifer. So like the well? Uh, yeah, so well would probably pull from an aquifer, exactly. And is well water clean and good, you think, without a filter? Mm, depends. Okay. Yeah, I mean, if you're in a highly industrialized agriculture area, probably not. It's That water is probably poisonous. But if the rain can't go through the soil because the soil's crust because it's desertified, then that aquifer is never going to fill up. That rain comes down and it evaporates and it's just this vicious cycle, right? But if we can increase the organic matter in the soil, that rain, when it does rain, will go through the soil. It will hold it there and it'll percolate back into our aquifers and replenish them. So nature works as a whole, just like, you know, we said it early on. So for people who want to have chickens in their own yard, like Mm -hmm. my best friend, Nicole, they do this. Yep. What what if they want to do this like rotating coop thing? Yeah. If they have enough ground, you can. And it also depends on how many birds you have, right? So it's kind of like a stocking rate, they call it. That means how many animals per acre or whatever. So if you only have a few chickens and a, and a decent sized backyard, you could definitely rotate them. And if you got good grass, it'll make your grass better. So if you're a fan of your lawn, that'd be a good input, they call it, versus fertilizers. So definitely do that. They'll be healthier because they're going to source any grubs or bugs digging around in the grass and even eat some of that grass. So I highly recommend that. Do you need to have a built coop to keep them in? Yes, you do need a coop because chickens want somewhere to roost at night and they want a home. So it, once, you're, once your chickens get comfortable where you're at, you can let them out during the day and they'll go right back in before it's Just dark. walk around your yard free? Oh, yeah. That's okay to do? Yeah, totally. It's okay for your kids to run around and play in that yard that has chicken poop in it? Your kids will probably be way healthier because they're going to be exposed. It's a, it's a viral load. Like, listen, farm kids don't ever get sick. But kids that grow up in the city that don't get exposed to all of these other uh, elements and cow poop and water trough. Like we used to go swimming in the cow's water trough in the ponds all the time. We never got sick because we're, our bodies are exposed to these viral loads or whatever you want to call them that our immune system builds up immunity to that so that we are good. Like during COVID, so many of my ag friends are like posting, the reason I don't have to worry about the shot is because and it was like a picture of a kid drinking out of a cow trough. <laughs> so. Okay, but here's the thing, though. Do the, the chickens that are just walking around your yard and stuff, they know where to lay their eggs? Or are you going to find eggs like e- it's Easter all over? If there's a hiding spot, you'll find some. It'll be <laughs> Easter eggs. But if, if your yard's fairly manicured and clean and they have a roosting box that they really enjoy, they'll go right back there and roost every time. Okay. Now, this is a bone I have to pick that I wanted to bring up with okay. you. Okay. Why does it seem like I can't find real farmer's markets? I can't. And what I mean is I look up a farmer's market. I'm all excited because I'm going to go get my raw milk and my eggs. This is the kind of stuff that I want to buy at a farmer's market. I show up. It's freaking fried Twinkies and necklaces. It's craft fair. What is the (laughs) craft? I don't want this. What happened to farmer's markets in cities? How do you find the real ones? Yeah. And how do you bring those back to your community? Yep. That that is a real problem, actually. Okay, I'm not crazy. You're, you're not crazy. It's frustrating that I'm driving 20 minutes and I show up and it's a craft fair. Yeah, and most it, it it's pretty, it's wild to me that it's called a farmer's market and it really is a craft fair. I mean, when I was selling beef for my family's ranch, I was the only food seller there. I'm lucky if I can maybe find honey and bee pollen. Right. I can't find anything. Yep. It is yep. so annoying. I'm sick of it. You know, we're, we're building a solution for all of this that we've been discussing. And one of those pieces of that is... Uh, a we will brand a farmer's market for pickup yay and it's going to be food it's not going to be a craft fair it's like you know we we will probably charge extra for trinkets because i don't want that there because it needs to be a farmer's market where you meet your farmer i mean listen if you can find a farmer's market right now and it's got food sellers that is a really great place to start sourcing because that person is the person standing in that booth is probably the person who raised it Now, I will throw out a caution. There is a growing black market grocery trend. In other words, people will go to like Costco or something and buy bulk, and then they'll take that and sell it on a street corner, and they just remove the stickers from that produce. So you do want to be careful and just really ask questions. What Uh, kind of questions do you ask to see if they are selling black market produce? Yeah, that's a good question. So if you are a complete novice in agriculture, not knowing where to start, just start asking them how it was raised, right? If you're talking about meat, what was the process of raising it? And a, and a, 
a farmer or rancher that really wants to build a relationship, they will love those questions, right? What was the process of raising? Where was it born? Uh, how old was it when you weaned it off of its mother? Maybe um, if it's on the produce side, like where did it? Where did this grow? Um, what are your practices? Ask them questions that might trip them up. And if they're not, if they don't even hesitate, then they're your grower, right? Okay. If, if they kind of, if they're kind of like, oh, well, we, you know, they're dancing around the question, they probably didn't do it themselves. That is freaky. Yeah. And mo- by the way, it's 2023. So most of these places are online. So where can I find your information? What I tell people when they go look for a farmer and rancher online, Google whatever you look, Google local beef, it'll populate. Go to the first thing on that website, go to the about section. Go to the about section and see what the story of the family is. That will tell you a lot about who you're buying from. I'll say this for the the grocery stores and even for the big four. A lot of what we have to buy, we told them what we wanted to buy when we spent our dollars. Yeah. When the orga- when organic mm-hmm. first became a thing, it was outrageously expensive. Mm-hmm. Then everybody in the last five, 10 years really started uh, opting for that. That's yeah. what we were buying. The prices have gone way down. Yep. So also organic today, it's not as expensive as it was in like 2000. Right. Right. And I'm even speaking towards like grass fed meat is usually more gamey. And so somebody's like, ooh, that's gamey. So they're like, okay, we'll put a bunch more shit in their mouth. And so it tastes sweeter. Like that was the answer. So we, the consumers, told them what we wanted them to do for us. And tell tell them what you told me about how uh, uh, the realities of grass fed. That's another thing you got to ask more questions yes, on. Yeah. So label laws are just so messed up, like, like pasture raised. Pasture raised. What, what do you think pasture raised sounds like? Oh, that animal is standing in the field like we're seeing behind us. That's what we think pasture raised is. But labels have been allowed to say, well, they just have to have access to pasture, right? When it comes to grass fed, if you see grass fed on the label, the label laws allow you to put grass fed on there because I think it's something like if it's spent 50% of its life on grass, well, here's the life cycle of a cow. A cow is born, it gets sold at about you know, six months, eight months old uh, into the commodity, and it's probably slaughtered around 18 months. So that's about half of its life. So now you can label grass fed, but it spent the last half of its life gorging itself on corn and grain. Yeah. Right. So now it's not the, 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 the meat is not expressing itself as a grass fed and finished animal. So what you need to look for is grass finished on the label. If it doesn't say grass finished, it's probably not finished. So there's these very, it's all marketing, man. And that's the most frustrating thing for me is people are manipulating the hell out of this game. Like I, I, I was a consultant for a, a jerky facility and the USDA locked up half a million dollars of our product because we had a late on the back of the package, there was a clear window that showed the jerky and it said made from premium cuts of beef. and This USDA person who had a wild hair up their ass for some reason said, we're stopping that from shipping. And this, by the way, is a package that they had utilized for like 10 years. Nothing changed. This one person for the USDA just got this wild idea that they were, that was a problem. And they, they're, they're, we, well, so we questioned them on, they're like, well, how do we know it's made from premium cuts of beef? That's misleading. As opposed to, the USDA itself allowing foreign beef to be labeled product of the USA, right? So you asked early on in the interview, like, what is happening that's being manipulating the system for the big guys versus the small guys? Me, as a small USDA meat processor, I jump through far more hoops to be USDA verified than beef that's slaughtered in a foreign country and then shipped over here. We have far more microscopes on us, and yet... It's sold freely throughout the country, and they don't have nearly the amount of scrutiny that we have to deal with. Okay, so this is like a dumb question, but remember that you're dealing with an audience primarily of millennials and Gen Z who are terrified of talking on the phone and talking to strangers. Um, Just the whole idea of like reach out to your local farmer, that's very intimidating to me. Like, where do I find their contact information? Is it, do I fill out a form online? Do I, is it, do you text them? Is that, is that like polite to text and say, I want to get more meat from you? Do you have to call? Like, what does the process actually look like when you're Googling local farmers and ranchers and like what you do? So first of all, you have to understand that this is a very antiquated system. 
our agricultural producers are your window into the old world that you as millennials have no idea about. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, what I mean by that is most of my f- family don't know how to manage a lot of the technology. So a Yeah, like there's not call, an Instagram you DM. No, no. Now, we're working on some solutions to help that, but a phone call is what you're going to do. Okay. So texting don't work. You know, a fill it out a form online doesn't work. And will work. a local farmer or rancher have like a phone number and say like these are our business hours or something? Yeah. So if you find their website, well, actually no, you probably call at eight o'clock at night and they're having dinner with their family and they're and gonna that's answer. Allowed? They're gonna answer. Listen, what's happening in the agricultural space? These producers are excited that people finally give a shit that people care about where their food came from. I mean, that's one of the things that I've been helping them understand is like, listen. Like my social media exploded. I've been on there a while. Nobody gave a shit. But when I started talking about connecting consumers with you, they got excited. Yeah. So they are excited that you are making yourself available for the the population that knows there's a problem and that would like to source direct. Okay. So you call them and then what do you say? So you call and like, if you're calling for beef, Hey, I'm looking to source beef right from the rancher. Tell them what you're doing. They'll be so excited to educate you. Be like, Oh, awesome. And how do you know if they're telling the truth? If you say, are you organic? How do you know if they are? Just at, well, get to know them, ask them what's your practices. You know, how do you finish your animal? Most producers are not going to lie to you. And and a lot of producers are starting, if you find them on a website, they're they're stepping into the technology space and they understand that customer service is going to be necessary. And so they're going to, they're going to know that you're looking for a little bit more information, especially if you're calling them than the average consumer would, because that's who is calling them. Just ask them questions. What, how do you finish the animal? If you don't care if it's corn and grain finished, which by the way, I'm a unique person that I like grass fed and finished because it is more gamey. Most people don't. In my world around the agricultural space, everybody hates grass fed and finished. They like the when you hear marbling in beef, you know, it's got great marbling. That just means more fat. That fat was necessary. You only got that on corn and grain. So your best steaks at your high-end restaurants are corn and grain finished. That's just how it's going to be. With GMO feed. Well, yeah, because, I mean, you can. it's rare to find somebody growing enough non-GMO corn and grain that they can finish livestock on that, right? So just right off the bat, just know that if you're, everybody's eating GMO. You're just, you are. If you're eating anywhere other than your own house and you know that that animal came right off a regenerative ranch, you're eating GMO. Just Like when you that. go out to eat, you mean? Yes. But that's why I say also... You know, I I am somebody that believes that all things in moderation, right? So if I'm eating a really nice steak out every once in a while, then it's not going to kill me. It's not going to leave enough residue or residual, you know, And whatever. I would agree with that. But what I'm going to say is when it comes to all things in moderation, the problem is we tell ourselves that. So then we're <laughs> like we go through the drive through on the way home and then we pick up this and then we eat this candy bar and this yep. process. It's And then, you know, you're putting all this endocrine disrupting crap on your body. So it's like yep. it's, then it's too much. Yeah. But what you're talking about because of how you and I eat, it is, first of all, a rarity when we go out to eat. Yep. So we are really doing it in moderation. The problem is people say that and they just are like, well, little thing here, a little thing here, but it's a hundred times a day. That's so right. It's not truly moderation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't fix stupid. So I'll just tell you what I know, which is <laughs> if you want to walk through life blindly and com- and complain and blame all your problems on everything else but yourself, I'm not here for you. Yeah. So you're asking them those questions yep. about that. And then um, what happens? Do you go to the real farm you drive up there and you get it or does it come to your house that's a question you can ask do you allow on-farm pickup if that's something that's really important to you there are producers that are doing that and they'll would they even take you for a tour of the animals i'm encouraging some will yeah and i'm encouraging that many more get into that because if we can bridge the gap between urban and rural that urban understands the importance of the rural community and what they need and rural understands that the urban uh, environment recognizes the importance of the role that they play. And I'm going to buy the beef from you. So your family has what you need. I'm encouraging these producers to start doing ecotourism or on-farm pickup. Like I was telling my friend, uh, at White Oaks Pastures, um, they have an incredible operation. They've been working on this for a long time and they were perfectly positioned to capitalize on the shift in the market during COVID, but they've got tours on farm. They do seminars, they do clinics. So you can, I I guarantee you every state across the nation has somebody that's allowing that. So ask them, do you do on farm pickups? 
Do you allow tours on the farm? Would, could we come and visit? Also, if you are a homeschooling mom, which so much of my audience homeschools, yep. what a great opportunity to teach your kids, uh, do a whole lesson uh, about food and everything. And then let's go see the chickens that we're eating. Let's go Absolutely. see the cows, you know, Absolutely. And, and, and have the farmer walk them through that process. That right there, that's a whole day at school. At the whole day of school and even take them to the slaughterhouse. You yeah. want to see kids light up, take them to a slaughterhouse. <laughs> now, they most slaughterhouses won't allow them to see the dispatching side where they actually, you know, kill the animal. But when we bring kids through the slaughterhouse and they get to, they, they light up and it like our culture has become so removed from death, not just in our food, but even in our personal lives. Mm-hmm. We have rest homes on every corner. Why? Because we don't want to watch or see mm. the death process of life. Yeah. And so, so many of our elderly are dying alone because that's an uncomfortable place to be. Well, the more we remove ourselves from that, the more disconnected we come become from what it means to be alive. Okay. And so what exactly is the system that you're creating that's going to help it become easier for us to know who our local farmers and ranchers yeah. are? Yeah. So we're building a software launches in March that will create a parallel economy. So I, I used Airbnb as an example earlier. We're doing that for food. So you open an app, you type in what you're looking for. Everything disappears on the app, uh, on the map, except for like, if I want to, if I want a rental with, with a jacuzzi, I'm only going to see rentals with jacuzzi. Like if I can say, I want a rancher that's, that's regenerative. Yes. I can find that. Yeah. Everything on the map disappears except for regenerative ranchers. If you want steak or beef, everything disappears except for beef. All transactions are done in the app to simplify it. Cause understanding the millennial urban environment versus and in comparison to the the, the producer market if we're going to get people to make this shift convenience is the thing we're up against right um so if i can connect you with your food sellers whether it's beef or dairy or or vegetables or eggs you name it and you can shop each of those different people and check out one time and then have a designated pickup location like the farmers markets that we're building now I've made it easy for you to check out one time. You save that story in your fa- store in your favorites. Now you're just going to get the same product from the same producers every time. So really what we're building is a system that allows people to shake the hand that feeds them across the nation. Okay. So when you talk about fixing the farmer's market so that there's a central location to pick up from all these approved farmers by you or whatever, uh, I'm I'm imagining there. So there has to be like a community leader, somebody that steps up that's like, I want to help, you know, partner with AJ yeah. and what you're creating to to like get the farmer's market going and everything. Like, are, are you finding people to start these? We will. So this is, I'm trying to like balance what's coming my way. I, I have so many people wanting to volunteer and I'm like, okay, I got a process. I got to get a software developed first, which it's, it is developing and that's great. But uh, we've got people all across the nation that want to help make this difference, right? Yeah. People in your audience, like you said, the homeschool communities, they know what's going on. They're, they're, a, you know, we all got red pilled if you weren't already during COVID. And it's like, oh, shit, we're in trouble. And so a lot of people are excited to get involved and help. So, yeah, these these local farmers markets will be community driven. Uh, the service also will allow you to rate the farm you bought from and the farm can rate the buyer as well because they've they've got to filter each other out. If If you got a buyer that's just a pain in the ass for everyone, they should be rated so nobody has to sell to them. Just right? like Uber. Just like Uber. It's same for the bu- for the seller. If you're buying beef and it turns out to be junk and you're really not happy with it and you talk to them and give them every opportunity to make it right and then other people are saying the same thing, I want people on our platform to know not all ag people are good, honest people as much as I so would then, like to believe. So what do people need? What do you need from people to like make sure that this thing happens? Oh, man. That's the biggest thing, right? We can do all the work we want, but if it doesn't get adopted by the consumers as a new way of doing business, it will not matter. Like we, we've been moving forward with faith that, you know, first of all, this idea was brought to me during COVID. I was selling beef for my family's ranch. Everything shut down. And I, when I served in Iraq, we took care packages into a small village. And I remember seeing the dad standing over in the corner watching us take care of his family. Mm. So when COVID hit and I'm hearing on the radio and the news about store shelves being empty, I'm thinking about this man's face every night. And I'm thinking about my little girls and me not being able to provide for my little girls. And I went, something's got to change. And then I had this 
idea. So this idea was brought to me by God. It's not, it, AJ is this like software as a service? Hell no. Matter of fact, I apologize to people because if I wasn't a mortal man who didn't have my own weaknesses, it had been done already. But I kept questioning every step of this. Am I the right guy? Am I the right guy? The right people showed up in my life and we got a little bit further. And then we got a little bit further to the point now that we're ready to go live and get this out there. So in order for this to work, consumers have to vote with their dollars. And if you didn't think that that was possible, look what happened to Beyond Meat. They got destroyed because we, the consumer said, we don't want that. Get it away. And so their market just tanked. The only way that the things that I'm working on and, and thankfully others as well, like I'm not the only guy working for this idea. Only way it works is if you, the consuming audience decide I'm going to do a little bit more work than just going to the grocery store, knowing that my meat's on this aisle and my lettuce is on this aisle and the dairy's on this aisle. If you're willing to do a little bit more work and meet the person and shake the hand that feeds you, that is the most stable thing you can do for your family's own food security, your family's own health. And in turn, we will help secure the food supply chain for our nation. If we don't, we are definitely staring down a very short clock to a major disruption that is going to cost a lot of people their lives. And is this something that when it launches this this coming spring, God willing, is going to be like you, you anyone will find this in their area or is it like only going to be a few cities at first? Yeah, it has to be a few cities at first until we roll out. And Am then- I one of them? Uh, yeah, yeah. Phoenix. Woo! Okay. God. Because I came from. Otherwise, I was going to scrap this whole interview. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, you know, when I when I spent time in Wyoming, Cody, Wyoming, there's half a million people in the entire state. So cows outnumber them like five to one. So what I was able to kind of put together in my process. So this has been four years of research and development. If I'm going to build something, I want to make sure it works. And the only way I know it works is if I experience as many positions in this as possible. So I went to Cody. and. I'm like, man, there's all these openings for slaughter. Like what's going on? Well, there's no consumers. So everybody's got their own cows. Like I have cows, you have cows, everybody's raising their own cows. So I have nobody to sell my cows to. Well, the opposite exists two states South. Arizona is a desert, literally a desert. You have producers that are making it happen here, which is awesome, but fat finished cows. That's hard to do in the desert. Yeah. So we're working on a network where we can take Montana and Wyoming beef where there's far more cattle than there are consumers and get that south into Nevada and Arizona where there's a shortage. So who's going to be the first people lucky enough to get to experience this uh, in the spring? It'll basically be Arizona north, Arizona, Utah, Idaho, Colorado, uh, Wyoming and Montana. Okay. And so in the meantime, people that live in major, like, let's say somebody in Manhattan or whatever, yes. I mean, yes. I, they, it would take me hours and hours to find, you know, drive to a farm and do yep. all this. Like they really have no other option. You do like good ranchers. Good ranchers, a great brand. Yeah. I, I, I've done some research on some of the, uh, so you have, you can buy direct from the ranch. And then you have a lot of ranchers. They're so busy ranching. They don't want to meet you, not because they don't like you, but they're busy. Yeah. So then you have produ- you have companies like Good Rancher or Rep Provisions or, I mean, we'll have our own in-house that works with ranchers. They're like, listen, I'd rather just focus on the ranching and then you take it that last mile. Cool. So, yeah, if you're in somewhere like New York, I would say Good Ranchers is a good one. Um, there's a really popular one that I don't recommend because they import I yep. think 100% from New Zealand. I know exactly who yeah. you're talking so about. Stick it's with good a ranchers. total sham. That's why, yeah. yeah, and that's exactly what I say about them also. While others will be regifting mugs and candles they got earlier this year, you'll be bestowing juicy burgers, crispy bacon, tender chicken, and phenomenal steak upon your secret Santas. Plus, Good Ranchers gift boxes are 15% off and as low as $99 until Christmas. Yes, we're talking Good Ranchers. And when you gift with Good Ranchers, you're making meals easy, supporting hundreds of American farms and keeping generations of flavor alive. Most of all, you're giving a gift that is truly delicious that you can be proud to stand behind. And just like we learned today, Good Ranchers Meat is only raised and packaged in the USA, not like the other guys, from small farms and ranchers in the Midwest. So if you or your loved ones can't easily get to know your local rancher, okay, you're talking like a major metropolitan, huge area, it would take you hours to go to some ranch to get your meat or you have no idea where to start. It just is what it is. Good Ranchers is a fantastic option and gift, especially for your dad. Good Ranchers 
Hunter's gift boxes are 15% off right now and as low as $99 only until Christmas. Just a few more days. And guess what? You get an additional 15% off from me with code Clark. So that's 30% off total, a phenomenal deal. Go to GoodRanchers.com with code Clark for an additional 15% off. Find all this in the show notes. Good Ranchers, American meat delivered. Um, AJ, so what is the app going to be called and where can people find updates to know what, like when it's coming yeah. out? So the app is called From the Farm. And uh, if you go to feedthepeoplebythepeople.com, you can sign up as a rancher or a farmer, or you can sign up as a consumer. And it's just our email list. So that is when we go live, I get shadow banned like crazy. As soon as I say fake meat on Instagram, like it's just, it's oh, great. Death. Yeah. Yeah. You guys will have fun with this one. <laughs> oh <laughs> God. It's uh, it's been a pain in the, ass. I mean, my, my social media went from 2000 to a hundred thousand people in six months. Awesome. And I'm at 3000 new followers That's in the, the last proof. four months. People want to change. People want this food. That's right. I'm like, okay, the market is ready. Now we got to get the product. So, so yeah, any of those people that are sourcing, uh, I think there's another one called seven sons. And so they're basically teaming up with their surrounding producers and saying, bring it into here and we can get out to you. So but yours is called, so, so you go from the farm and then go to feed the people by the people.com join our email list. So I can notify you when the app is live. And just kind of keep you updated. I've only, just so people know, I've only sent two emails out there. I'm not spamming nobody. Like, if this is what I tell people. My following is not my following. I've been entrusted to bring a group of people together that want to make a difference in our country. This is not an AJ deal. This is, I'm a tool. And I've got people around me that are also tools to leverage something that will make a big difference. You know, we have, we're going to have to raise a lot of money. But we have this, uh, we have this, really important thing that we will not take venture capital because I do not want anybody in my ecosystem that when we do what we set out to do, JBS comes along and says, we'll give you a billion dollars. I don't want you near me. I want only people around me. This is a legacy business. It will be within my family's care for as long as physically possible. And so that means as we go to raise a lot of capital, it will only come from philanthropy and people that want to see our country have a different outcome. I don't want money for the sake of money because it will get bastardized. From a legislative standpoint, last question before yes. we wrap up, what exactly do we need to be voting for or asking our local politicians for in terms of saving our food system? I'm so glad you asked that because our biggest threat looking down the road will be legislative. It'll be lobbyists. As soon as we, you know, like I said, big four have 85% of the market. As soon as they have 83, 82, 81, 80, and they can track it back to what we're doing, they will come out of the woodworks. Big ag, big pharma will all team up because they don't want this to happen. They won't want this to happen. So people like Thomas Massey working to get the Prime Act, that's something you should pay attention to. What's happening with the Prime Act? That Prime Act is perfect for what we're doing. Um, when you buy an animal from a rancher, if it's a share, if it's a portion of an animal, it's called a cow share. They're trying to pass, some people are trying to pass laws to ban cow shares. Why? Because they ban cow shares. Now you can only buy from the grocery store. It makes it harder to source. So pay attention to the Prime Act. Pay attention to your uh, people in, in, in office that have agriculture backgrounds. If you find your ag background uh, 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 senators, you're talking to people that know what we're talking about and they want to see it different. That's why Thomas Massey is so great. I'm a huge fan of his. Harry Hegman. Met with her up there in Wyoming. Same thing. She's pushing hard for the mandatory country of origin labeling to get back on the list. So um, the farm bill was delayed. Pay attention to what's going into the farm bill because that's basically dictating how your food is produced and what what um, services go into supporting that. You know, one thing we didn't talk about, higher than the veteran suicide rate in our country is agriculture. Mm. Why is that? Uh, it's a lifestyle when you lose it and, and it's also financial because there's really no actual help. And so when you're the guy, have you ever watched Yellowstone? No, but I mean, my okay. audience loves it. So their biggest concern in Yellowstone, the entire season is keeping the ranch, not being the generation that loses it. And when you are leveraged because of the cost to do business as a farmer and you're getting, you know, farmers and ranchers get 14 cents on every dollar. That's what they get. And when they're the ones putting in 
hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of inputs and equipment to raise that food and they're leveraging their farm and ranch and it comes down to it and they're the ones going to lose their family heritage. It's a lot to deal with. Well, that's why I think it's going to be scary for some of the ag people listening. You saying like you need to do what's right and switch over to regenerative. Mm -hmm. Now, here's what I say about that, too. Just be open minded. Don't everybody that's in regenerative. They weren't initially in regenerative. Okay, they did it one way. And finally, they got to a breaking point and they had to make a change. If you're sick and tired of being controlled or if you're sick and tired of the the dollars you're putting into inputs, I've got a friend in northern Utah, uh, McMurdy Ranch. They're crushing it. And not only are they crushing it with their direct-to-consumer sales now, but also they are saving hundreds of thousands of dollars in inputs because they've gone regenerative. So now they're making more profit, which means they're more resilient to financial challenges. Plus their land is now more resilient to drought and other things. Where can people find you on social media? So Instagram is a period J underscore Richards. Uh, I do have uh, X that I'm trying to grow because they won't silence me there. And it's just, I got lucky. It's my name, AJ Richards. And TikTok, surprisingly, is full of patriots. You're on TikTok? Yes. I'm a millennial, an older millennial on TikTok. But I got, I posted this video recently and I'm like, I'm going to get all kinds of hate because I thought that's where all the libs were hanging out. Man, I got thousands of comments and maybe a handful of negative. So I'm like, whoa, the patriots are on TikTok? What the heck? Okay, I love it. Let's build our parallel food economy. Thank you, AJ, for coming on the spillover. Thank you. This is something we have to fight for. We have to fight for our food and our health. We have to change the pattern now for our kids so our grandkids have a chance. We have to be the generation that grew up on goldfish crackers, processed chicken nuggets, and high C and say, enough! If you cut that crap out, you will be amazed at how much less you eat because you aren't always starving. The real food fills you up, as we talked about. I rarely snack anymore because my meals are so nutrient-dense and I don't crave snacks. We don't need that stuff in the middle of the store. Those are extras if you can afford it. I hope AJ's advice was helpful and impactful that you will take what he said and put it into your New Year's resolution for your family to go through your cabinets, throw all the processed seed oil junk out and start over. I hope we can encourage our communities to bring back real farmers markets like he was talking about and that you'll attempt this path with me to relearn behavior that's been ingrained in us. One of my New Year's resolutions personally is to learn how to make sourdough starter and make my own bread. So if you're on the sourdough starter gang, um, I hope that you're ready. I don't know if I am, but we're going to do it. I'm so passionate about this topic. So I have a few really exciting guests lined up for the first couple months in the new year. From understanding food ingredients and what to look out for to what to know about your kids' school cafeteria food, how to lead the change on what they're being served, the formula debate, even how to build a non-toxic home from the ground up. There is so much to look forward to from the Spillover podcast in 2024. So make sure you're subscribed. Leave that five-star review. Uh, Watch these episodes on Real Alex Clark YouTube. By the way, the metallic cowboy hat that AJ was wearing, I asked him about it. He said, well, this is my tinfoil hat. Next week's episode is going to throw a glitch in the matrix. I am speaking to a clinical psychologist on the truth about healing depression and how your antidepressants are making it worse. He believes that ADHD is completely fake and that the real reason so many women are being diagnosed with bipolar disorder is, well, you'll have to hear from him. We discussed the corruption in the pharmaceutical industry, how many therapists have an interest in keeping you mentally unwell and much more. You will remember this episode next week for the rest of your life. It is that game-changing. Don't miss it. Next Thursday, 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern, wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Alex Clark, and this is The Spillover. Merry Christmas. Love you. Mean it. Bye.